good to see each and every one of you out this morning. Bright, smiley, happy faces, and everybody's ready to hear from the Lord today. Amen? That was a little bit on the weak side. Everybody's ready to hear from the Lord today. Amen? All right, that's better. We need to be able to come to glorify the Lord and to hear from the Lord. And again, we are very thankful for each and every one of you coming and being with us and uh, being a part of our service today. This morning, we're going to uh, we're going to take a look at uh, some scripture from the old a- or from the new and the old testament this morning. And you know, we live in a society today where we um, we are bombarded on all sides by viewpoints and by uh, uh, just a lot. Of, anybody find yourself being busy, but at the end of the week, you can't, for the life of you, you can't tell what you were busy doing all week long? I don't, maybe I'm the only one that does that. I don't know. Uh, but it seems like we're a busy society, and uh, then we get distracted. And some of that busyness are things that we tolerate. We're going to talk today about the trouble with toleration. Does anybody know what the trouble with toleration is? It's there in the parentheses. Because when we tolerate things in our life, something ends up replacing God. The trouble with toleration is that something winds up replacing God in our life or begins to crowd God off to the side somewhere. And God is no longer at that point our focal point. God is no longer the most important thing in our life, but God becomes a sideline. This morning, if you have your Bibles, turn with me. We're going to get right into Scripture. We're going to go back to the book of Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to, uh, when you get there, uh, I'm going to be turning for a moment in the middle of that over to the book of St. Matthew chapter 22. So if you want to hold a finger at uh, Matthew 22, you can find that and then also find Revelation 2. We're only going to be reading a couple of verses from here and then we're going to move on. But as we think about these uh, scriptures this morning, Christ is sending a message in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. He is speaking expressly to the churches, and he is speaking, as we speak to churches, we speak to what? You ought to know by now. What are churches comprised of? Individuals, okay? So these letters come to us as a letter that we ought to pay attention to. Sometimes when we get a letter and it's addressed to a specific place, we may assume in our minds, well, that has no relevance for me. And we could not be any further from the, uh, from the truth in that. If that's what we're thinking when Christ is speaking, well, I'm glad he's talking to them over there. You know, sometimes in our services, we may, uh, we may have that idea. Boy, I know that person across the aisle over there. They really need to hear this. I hope they're paying attention today. If you ever heard Brother Bill Pennington uh, speak in the past or sometime, uh, you may have uh, uh, heard him say, turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor he's not talking to you unless he is. Okay. So sometimes we need to hear these things. When Christ is speaking in these letters in Revelation 2 and 3, they are all things that are applicable to our lives today. Now, they were sent specifically to those seven churches, but the message is still applicable. I'm not going to read the beginning of the letter to the church in Ephesus, but I want to remind you that when Christ wrote these letters or had John to write them down, when he dictated them for John to write, Uh, and sent them. They're under the authority of Christ. And when he sent these letters, the first thing that he nearly always did is said, I know your works. And then he would name the good things that they were doing. You know, how many of you need a little encouragement from time to time? And having a little bit of encouragement up front can help take a little bit of the sharpness off of a reprimand, can it? So when we know that, all right, we're in good graces, we're in good standing, he knows that we're doing this, but here's some things we need to brush up on and makes it a little easier in our life. And so Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, as Christ is 
writing this letter to the church in Ephesus, he's given them the, I know your works. But now in verse 4, he comes to this. Nevertheless, even though you're doing these things, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Who and what should be the first love of every one of our lives? If you're a born-again believer, who should be your first love? God. All right? Now, men, you need to love your wives. And wives, you need to love your husbands. Parents, you need to love your children. Okay? Church family, we need to love one another. We have been commanded to do all those things, but the right love relationship with between spouses, children, parents, church family, friends cannot be right until we have the vertical relationship with God to love God first right in our lives. So what Christ is saying, he, he's told them, I know your works, but then in the middle of that, he says, nevertheless, there's a problem. I want to ask you this this morning. I want you to think about this as an individual. Don't, don't be concerned about anybody else here this morning except you when I ask this question. If we as individuals today all received a letter from Jesus, what would be the nevertheless that he would point out in our lives what would be the nevertheless that Jesus would point out in my life what would be the nevertheless that he would point out in your life when he would come to that point and say okay here's an area that needs to be changed here's an area that you need to give over to me that here's an area that needs to be submitted to me the church at Ephesus he says you have left your first love so what is our responsibility when it comes to love? Keep your finger in Revelation chapter 2 because we're going to come right back to that. Flip over to Matthew chapter 22. And in Matthew chapter 22 verse 37, we find that Jesus, after being challenged about what was the greatest of the commandments, says that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So with that in mind, as a responsibility for all believers, in the book of Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, when he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. You have left your first love. Who then had the church at Ephesus left behind? Christ. Okay? It wasn't that they were against Christ, but their love for Christ was not a burning desire in their hearts. It was not an upfront desire. It was not their primary motivation because somewhere along the way, they had tolerated some things that had come between them and that burning desire to love God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, and with all of their mind. They had grown cold toward Christ. And church, let me tell you today, when we grow cold toward Christ, as individual believers and as the body of Christ corporately, when we grow cold toward Christ, we grow cold toward his sacrifice. We, go, we grow cold toward the precious blood of Christ that was given as the propitiation or the substitute for our sins. We grow cold toward God's love for us and God's love through us. We grow cold towards his grace. In other words, we will have a, 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 a problem with flaunting grace or with overriding grace we'll go out and we'll sin regularly and say well God's grace will cover me and so we're no longer in love with God's grace we're no longer in love with his mercy with his redemption and we grow cold in general in our relationship with him but there's an answer there's a way to get out of that and that answer is, is that we are careful about what we tolerate. Because the trouble with toleration is that another God will move in and take over. 
The idea of them leaving their first love most likely was not a sudden leaving. Do you know a lot of the times it has nothing to do with a sudden leaving? People come to church, they get involved, they want to be a part of what's going on, and then something comes up one Sunday. Maybe you got sick. Maybe you had a trip planned. Whatever the case might have been. And you missed that Sunday. That first Sunday, how do you feel about it? You feel somewhat guilty about it. You know, you, you, you miss the fellowship, you miss the being a part. But you get that second Sunday in a row and all of a sudden something else comes up that was beyond your control and you miss that Sunday. And then you miss a third Sunday. By the time you get to the fourth Sunday, you're not even concerned about it being Sunday anymore. You didn't put forth an effort to try to set the clock to get up and be in God's house. And you weren't thinking about that love for Christ that you had. And so I believe that in the church in Ephesus, I think probably what had happened was is that they were tolerating some things. This is a little later than Paul's letter to the, to the, uh, the church in Ephesus. So the so time has gone by. We know Timothy had been there or has been there and that Timothy was encouraged to remind them to stay in tune with God and to stay to not tolerate things. But somewhere down the line, some things came in and so we gradually, the fire gets dimmer in our lives. And what can those things be? Sometimes they're things that take our time. It can be things that take our energy. It can be things that take our commitment, our commitments change. And quite honestly, what it does is it takes our loyalty away from God. So what do we do? Do we throw up our hands and quit? Do we give up? Do we assume that God has given up on us? Is that where we go with that? No, we don't. Because if you flip back over to Revelation chapter 2 and look at one verse below verse 4, verse 5... In Revelation 2, verse 5, Jesus says to them, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Remember your allegiance. Remember to that time what it was like to have that close personal relationship with God, to have that peace in your heart, to have that love for God, to to be able to find joy in the grace of God in your life. And be restored. Repent. Be restored. How many of us in some small area or large area in our lives need to repent and be restored through Jesus? There's no other way. There's no other place. There's no other how to be restored except through Jesus Christ. And that is to come to that idea of repentance, that trust in God and and his mercy upon our lives. This morning we're going to learn from the life of Solomon. Solomon was known for many things. So we're going to make a real quick list in case you're not aware of who Solomon was. And uh, going back to a very, very early part, first off, Solomon was David's son. He was David's son who God had ordained would be David's successor as the king over Israel of that time. That, uh, Solomon is known for his wisdom. If you've read your Bible back in the book of 1 Kings chapter 11, we're going to be reading from 11, but not to that point this morning, or excuse me, not in 11, I think it was in 3. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 3, you'll find that God gave Solomon an opportunity to ask for something that he uh, would like to have and and Solomon could have asked for power he could have asked for wealth he could have asked for a lot of things but Solomon said God give me wisdom and here's the extra part to that that's so important that I might judge your people well that I might be a good king and that I might rule over and so God gave him that and God acknowledged and said you could have asked for wealth you could have asked for power but because you've asked for wisdom on behalf of my people, I'll give you all of those things. And so we know that Solomon was a very wise man. The Bible says he's the wisest man who has ever lived. He was a man of great wealth. We know Solomon because of his writings, the books of Proverbs, 
Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs. And we also know about Solomon because he was the one after David that God ordained to build the temple. And it was the most magnificent temple. It was a temple that went down in the history of mankind and when Israel sinned before God and God allowed the Babylonians to come in and to overtake and to overrun uh, Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed and it was, it was looted <coughs> and it was pillaged and, and all of the wealth and all the things were taken from it. And later in the book of Nehemiah, when they went back to rebuild the temple and they laid out the temple floor, obviously they've come out of, uh, out of bondage. They don't have the wealth. They don't have all the things that they had before. And they're in the rebuilding process. And the scripture says that whenever they laid out the foundation, that a lot of the young people praise God and worship because now we have uh, the beginnings of a place of worship. But the Bible says that the older people, those who had been alive before the captivity and had seen the splendor and the glory of Solomon's temple wept because the new temple was not nearly the size and it was not going to be nearly as beautiful as their original place of worship that God had allowed and God had dwelt in. Folks, I want to remind you this morning that you are the temple of Almighty God. Set yourself up to be what God has called you to be. Exalt, let God be exalted in your life and lift up his name. Glorify and honor God with your life and be a temple that is worth having. Let God come in and make the temple of your life beautiful and honorable before him. But this morning, in all of the good things that Solomon did, we also know that there were some issues in Solomon's life. And so this morning, from Solomon's life, we will see the trouble with toleration. So if you will, turn with me this morning in your Bibles to the book of 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. God has been speaking to David and God has a plan laid out. David had, God had used David as a fighting king. And so when David desired to build a temple for worship, instead of using the tabernacle that the portable uh, worship place that they had used for so many years God said no because you've shed too much blood but I will allow your son and so Solomon was the one that was ordained and David had gathered wealth and and David had gathered everything so that it would be prepared and now it is nearing that time that Solomon is about to take over and David being a good father a man after God's own heart sits down with Solomon and he gives Solomon a charge have any of you ever been charged? I'm, I'm not talking about through the court system, okay? Not getting into that business right now, all right? But have you had someone to sit down and just give you that earnest plea about how to live your life and how to do, you know, how, how to be successful in life? And so I charge you to do these things. I highly encourage you to do these things. Well, that's what David does in chapter 2. So we're going to read in 1 Kings chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. Now the days of David, or the length of his life, drew near that he should die. And he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. Now we're going to go ahead with some reading. Turn the page to 1 Kings chapter 3. And from 1 Kings chapter 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 3. And I want you to begin to see a progression of things David has charged Solomon. It is God's charge to Solomon. It's God's charge to any young person coming up or any, any person of any age, actually, that is a follower of God. Keep these things. And we'll go back and talk about this momentarily. But now in chapter 3, beginning of verse 1, Now Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married Pharaoh's daughter, 
Then he brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall all around Jerusalem. Meanwhile, the people sacrificed at the high places because there was no house built for the name of the Lord unto those days. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father, David, except that he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. Now turn your Bibles over just a few other chapters over to 1 Kings chapter 11. First Kings chapter 11, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. From the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. Folks, I want you to know today that the trouble with toleration is that something ends up replacing God. The trouble with toleration in our lives is that something ends up replacing God. In the first reading this morning from 1 Kings chapter 2, which we're going to go back and talk about, we have David's dying charge to his son who is about to be the king. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, we have Solomon's unholy alliance and his tolerance of the dark corners. And in chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, we have the result of Solomon's toleration of things that were against God. So let's go back and let's talk about these things. Beginning in 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, we have David's dying charge. And the first thing that David says to him is, uh, after he knew that he was about to die, he, he says to him uh, to be strong. Be strong. Not strong in yourself, not strong in your abilities, not strong in the family name, but how is our most appropriate and best way for us to be strong? It is when we are strong in the Lord. Later, Paul talks about that. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. As Christians today, it has been our charge by God through Paul that we are to be strong in the Lord. What does it mean to prove it out? Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. He wasn't talking about the human testosterone-filled man. Go out and prove yourself. Go out and arm wrestle everybody that comes along. There, one evening this week at the fair, I was sitting down. I'd found a place to sit. I'd been out visiting with young families, and, and uh, I saw something that was a little bit humorous. It reminded me of, I hope, younger years whenever I was younger and hopefully dumber. But uh, there were two young men that had walked by. They were teenagers, and uh, they went over, and they were walking around, and I was sitting down, had a little something to eat, just taking the load off for a minute, and I looked over, and they had gone over, and they found one of the trash cans. And they squared up over the top of that trash can to have an arm wrestling match with each other, right in the middle of the fair. You know, the best thing they've got going on with everything happening is we got to, we got to determine right now who the man is here, you know. That was not what David was speaking 
to Solomon about. He wasn't saying, go see who you can outdo at arm wrestling or uh, Indian leg wrestling or at pinochle or something of that nature. When he said, prove yourself a man, it was to be prove yourself to be a man of God. Folks, we need, we need men and women today. We need you. God needs you to be men and women of God. We need to be out proving God's love in our lives. And so he says, live it out. Be a man or be today a woman of God. Go out and prove yourself in God's work. And in verse 3, David clearly charged him to maintain his life in full regard to the Word of God. See, I think sometimes it's real easy for us. We know what we consider to be enough of the Word of God. We have applied what we consider to be enough of the Word of God. Well, preacher, I got to the point of salvation, or preacher, I got to this point, or that point, or some other point. But in order for us to prove ourselves in the Word of God, when he gets to verse 3, he says, keep the charge of the Lord. How many of us even know what the charge of the Lord is? How many of us are studying our Bible to even know what God's Word says to us and how we ought to live our lives and how we ought to come to the Lord? How many of us are studying God's Word to walk in His ways regularly, not when it's convenient or not when you just happen to get back on the right path, but are regularly walking in His ways, keeping His statutes, keeping His commandments, His judgments, and his testimonies. How many of us are applying ourselves to that? Or have we tolerated something else? Well, preacher, I don't have time for that. Because I've got all these other things I've got to do. I've got all these other things that I apply myself to. And you don't understand. I just don't have time. Well, I tell you today, and I challenge you on this. That you'll look up and something else will be your God. Something else will take over. When we begin to tolerate in our lives and i'm not even necessarily talking about terrible sin because it never jumps out at us that we're tolerating off the cuff the terrible of the sins but what happens is as we move the marker we move the line a little at a time people move the line at one point we won't do this but well i'll do a little bit of that and i'll move the line up just a little bit but that's as far as i'm going to go and then a little peer pressure a little societal pressure and we've moved the line a little bit more and we're tolerating more of the world and we're doing less for the kingdom work and doing less for god walk in his ways keep his statutes keep his commandments keep his testimony keep them all keep them fully and keep them above all else and see there's where we fail so often is we're not keeping the word of god above all else in our life Oh, preacher, I keep the word of God when it's convenient. I keep the word of God when it's in line with what I think I want. I keep the word of God under this circumstance or under that circumstance, but surely he doesn't mean to keep the word of God above all else. Yes, God means for us to keep his word above all else. And that was the charge that Solomon received. I want you to keep that in your mind because as we move forward, we're going to see the downfall of Solomon's life in his relationship with God and as his ability to be the godly king that God would have had him to be. So we move on to 1 Kings chapter 3. And we look at the verses that we find there in chapter 3. We find in 1 Kings chapter 3, a couple of things stand out. First and foremost, there is an unholy alliance. And we have, along with that, the tolerance of dark corners in life. You know, I think sometimes we aren't aware of dark corners in our life. You ever think about that at home? I don't know how many of those tall corner lamps that Kelly has bought since we've been married. I don't know what happens to them. We'll have one, and, and next thing I know, we're having a yard sale. Put that in the yard sale. What, what's the matter with it? I don't like the color of it anymore. I don't, well, I, I don't need that. We're not going to use those anymore, so put that in the yard sale. We're not going to use that anymore. And lo and behold, the next time we go to the store, she comes dragging one of them home. Guys, have you ever put one of those together? The cord runs up through the middle of it, and there's about four sections. They're as unwieldy as they can be. That bottom thing weighs about 15 pounds that holds it to the floor, you know, 
and you got to turn those little pieces of pipe and keep the cord from twisting up because if the cord twists up it makes a mess you know it's just a big ordeal but we got to light the corners up so we buy a corner lamp i think a lot of times we're not paying enough attention to lighting up the corners of our life because that was one of the things that solomon did not do see in chapter 3, the very first statement in chapter 3, verse 1 is, Now Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married Pharaoh's daughter to seal the deal. Well, what's the big deal with that? Because Solomon was, built, was making a treaty with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, in order to make his kingdom stronger rather than relying on God and what God had already said he would do for the kingdom of Israel. If you go back to chapter 2, verse 3, after you have the charge about keeping all the law of God and, and the law of Moses, it says that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. In other words, keeping the law of God is the only treaty that you need. That's the only, uh, the, that's the only thing that you need to have in your life is to do that. But what did Solomon do? Solomon goes out and says, hey, let's make a treaty so that my kingdom will be stronger. And so he had a, an unholy alliance. He tolerated giving over influence in the people that God had chosen specifically to be his people to the city that God had chosen to be the place where his temple would be. He had given over the influence of his own life. I, I need to get advice from Pharaoh. I need to have the backup of Pharaoh because you know what? I just don't think God's quite enough. You say, oh, preacher, I would never do that. Sure we will. We do it all the time. We do it all the time in all kinds of areas in our lives. We start tolerating an outside influence coming in. We are bombarded by outside influences. And whether you realize it or not, we have to be very careful or we are going to be making unholy alliances in the world today. Oh, well, we need to, don't say that to get along. Do that to get along. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's make it a little bit more secure just to get along rather than standing on what the word of God says Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh and Egypt to secure his power rather than relying on God through obedience let me explain to you this morning what sin is a lot of times I don't think you know everybody knows the definition of sin is any rebellion against God right and that's the, that's the layman's simple terminology for sin is anything that is in opposition to God in our lives that it becomes sin. But I want to tell you what sin really is. Sin is a perceived shortcut to a godly outcome. Sin is a perceived shortcut to a godly promise. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 in the garden when Eve ate of the fruit. What was the words of Satan? Eat the fruit and you will be like gods. Eat the fruit, you won't die. Eat the fruit, you're suddenly going to have all this knowledge and all these things. How many of you know things today about this world that you really wish I could back up and just not even know? And I think everybody here ought to raise your hand. There are some bad stuff going on in this world today. There's things going on that none of us have any business knowing about. Why? Because of the brokenness of sin. Because at some point in time, and remember Romans 3.23, the scripture says, we've all sinned to come short of the glory of God. None of us can put ourselves above Eve and flaunt ourselves and say, well, I'd have done better than that. No, you wouldn't. You haven't. I haven't. We can't claim that. But sin is a perceived shortcut to the outcome that God has given of a godly promise. So any type of sexual misconduct, sexual perver perversion outside of the, uh, uh, of the bonds of marriage, guess what that is? It's a shortcut to get what God promised that you could have in marriage. But what you find out is it's not as good as what you have in marriage. 
any of those things, anything that we can think about today, okay? We don't want to, people today don't want to work for wealth, so we'd rather go out and steal. It's a perceived shortcut to an outcome. Just had a conversation this morning about someone that had no need to do what they were doing, taking some things, and what did they do? They wound up in trouble, and now their life is completely turned upside down in a big mess that they never would have had to have done. But there was a per perceived shortcut to an outcome. They were more interested in laying up treasure on the earth than they were about laying up treasure in heaven. Folks, it's all around us. It's going on all around us today. Where does it start? It starts when we tolerate. The Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Eve did not resist and, and Adam was there with her and he didn't resist. There's where the problem is, is that there was nobody resisting the devil. They were tolerating. Well, let's listen to what he has to say. We have got young people all around our world today that are wrapped up in all sorts of false religions and false ideas and false beliefs because they're somewhere along the line. They said, I want to be tolerable and I want to hear what everybody has to say. And then they get drug off into something that has absolutely no value for their life. Verse 2. Meanwhile... While Solomon is off taking care of this unholy alliance and spending time getting married to the daughter of the Pharaoh of Egypt, meanwhile, I think it was it used to be, did anybody here ever listen to those old radio, uh, what were they, uh, kind of like radio sitcom or, you know, radio stories, kind of like uh, some of them soap operas, you know, it was a radio soap opera just about, you know. And somewhere along the line, have you ever heard that old, you know, that deal? There used to be a lot of those that were Western. Or whatever. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, you know. Meanwhile, while, Pharaoh, while Solomon is doing all these other things that he should not have been doing, what's going on in his kingdom? The people sacrificed at the high places. Preacher, I don't know what the high places are. Huh? Does that really matter? Yeah, that's the dark corners. The high places were elevated places. They would go up on a, a hill. Sometimes there would be a, a, a group of trees. You'll hear read it or read about it in the Bible sometime. They, they sacrificed in the groves. So there might have been a, a group of trees, clump of trees up on a hill. And they would set up an altar there. Now, almost always in the Bible, with just a very minor exception, you're going to find that every time it is mentioned in the Bible that the people worshipped at the high places... It has to do with idol worship. Okay? Almost always. It, was, it, would, have been, it would have been the worship of Baal. It would have been the worship Ashtaroth. We're going, we've already read about that over in chapter 11. Um, uh, Milcom, or whatever the guy's name was, that, that god. Um, and all of these other gods. Chamosh and, uh, and all of these other gods. And so that was where they would go and worship. Now, the children of Israel had been commanded by God not to worship in those places. Now, it says, so what do we do? We're looking for exceptions. See, here's the problem. When something comes up to, for us to tolerate, what are we looking for? We're looking for the exception to God's rule. The justification on how to continue to carry this out. So what was their justification? Does anybody see it there in verse 2 of chapter 3? They worshiped in the high places because there was no house built for the name of the Lord until those days. So we don't have a place to go and worship. Does anybody remember any of that? You know, something that sounds familiar to that? Oh, we don't have a place to worship in. Or how about this? We don't have a place to worship. Remember when Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments? What did the people cry? Oh, Moses hasn't come down. We don't have a God. What do we need to do? That's where Aaron said, give, give me all your earrings. Give me all your gold, all this stuff. He put them in the fire, melted them down. The Bible says whenever it came out, he formed it into a golden calf until Moses came down and says, what have you done? He said, I don't know. We threw some gold in the fire and a cow popped out. <laughs> you know, when we're tolerating sin, that's about how stupid it sounds. I don't know, God, I was going along serving you just fine. Everything was great. And all of a sudden, one day, 
you know, everything just, the wheels fell off the wagon and it just all came apart. No, it didn't. We're hearing more and more and we're hearing about big name uh, people that have been trusted and trusted and trusted, uh, ministers and things like that, that have gone into what we're calling today in order to not call it sin, we're calling it moral failure. That moral failure did not suddenly happen. It's because somewhere along the line there was some tolerance. Folks, I want you to know I am guilty of tolerating things in my life that I ought not to tolerate. And I'm quite sure you all are guilty of tolerating things in your life that you shouldn't tolerate. And it is impacting your relationship with Almighty God. Because look at what happens in verse 3. The first sentence of verse 3 sounds fantastic. And Solomon loved the Lord walking in the statutes of his father David. Boy, if you could put a period there instead of a comma, we got something going on. But right in the middle of verse 3, there is another word. Everybody say that word out loud. Except. He's doing a great job, except. That is equivalent to the same word that God was speaking to, Jesus was speaking to the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. I know your works, I know all these things. Nevertheless, except you have lost your first love. Solomon, you're doing great. Except, except for what? Except that not only did the people sacrifice in the high places, but Solomon has sacrificed and burned incense in the high places. The man that God had set aside, the man that God had ordained to be the next leader and king of Israel, and there is no leadership in this man's life because he has not only tolerated it for his people, but he has tolerated it for himself now. And throughout the books of Kings and Chronicles, you'll read the stories of the kings, and there will be a record, and you hear it, you see it several times. I think there's at least four or five times that it's written in these accounts that such and such king did that which was right in the sight of God, except he did not cut down the groves and remove the high places. They left, they tolerated the dark corners. Look, as long as everything's going on good out here in the open where it can be seen, who cares what's happening over here in the corner? Let's don't spend any time about what's happening. Listen, I want to ask you today, what's happening in the dark corners of your life? What's happening in the areas that you have not submitted to God? What's happening in your life? What are you tolerating in the areas of your life that have not been given over to God willingly by you? You know what the Bible says that Christ ought to be? He ought to be the Lord and master of our life. And that is not a forced opportunity. I want you to know today that Jesus Christ is not going to come into your life, kick the door open on your life and come in and take over your life and force you into submission to him. When we talk about the submission to the will of God, when we talk about him being the Lord and master of our life, it is because we have laid ourselves down as a living sacrifice and said, God, here I am. Come in and take over my life. I want my life lived in accordance with your will. And that's what it means for the Lord to be the Lord of our life. Not that he's coming in and taking over in, uh, in, in a big coup or something like that. Solomon loved God and Solomon was obedient, except... I've asked you a while ago, what are the neverthelesses in your life? So now let's get to this point. What are the accepts in your life? See, because here's what everybody in here knows about you. Oh, I go to church with them every Sunday. They're fine folks. Oh, my goodness. They're fine, fine people. That's, I think Andy Griffith used to talk about that. Oh, they're fine, fine people. They're fine folks. But we don't want everybody to know about the accepts, do we? And I want you to know this this morning. They don't have to be blatantly rebellious tolerances or accepts. They don't have to be sinful accepts. They don't have to end at a painful torture or prison sentence. What is keeping you from God's best for you? That's what you're tolerating. 
What are you tolerating? It is what is keeping you from God's best for you in your life. And while we're on the accepts, see, we're going to get to a point, and we're not going to read it all this morning. You can go back and read it. It's in chapter 11 of the, of the book of 1 Kings. We're, going to, we're not going to read that far into it this morning. But after Solomon's sin, God tells him, I made a promise to your dad, to David, that you would remain on the throne, but I'm going to take the kingdom away from you. I'm not going to rend it from you. I'm not going to snatch it from you, and I'm not going to do it. I'm going to let you live, and I'm going to let you have to deal with what you've done. But here's how it's going to be taken away from you. The kingdom will be removed from you through your sons. And I will take the kingdom away from them. And the very first thing that Solomon's son did after he got control of the kingdom is he went in and he became overbearing. And that's when the kingdom of Israel was divided. He said, I'm going to leave one tribe, the tribe of Judah, the, the southern kingdom. Judah is only, the only thing that's going to be under your family rule from this time forward. The northern kingdom and all the other tribes are going to be taken away from you in your lineage. Because you tolerate it. I want to ask you today, because here's what we don't think about. You say, look, preacher, I'll bear the consequences for my tolerance in my life. How is your tolerance impacting your family? Men, how is your tolerance of things other than God's will for your life, how is that impacting your wife? How is that impacting you as a father? Moms, how, wives, how's that impacting you and your relationship with your husband and relationship with your children? Parents together, how are your tolerances impacting your children? Because what do our children learn? Our children learn what they see us do. It is an easy thing for us to tell them, do as I say, but not as I do. But what do we all know about children that they're going to do? They're going to do as we do. They'll do as you say as long as you're watching and as long as there's a threat of punishment. But when they get older, what do they do? They do what they've seen. They do what they've seen. It literally came down to the point that when Solomon's son took over the kingdom, that he did worse. See, that's the problem is it's not just our kids are maintaining. They're not just holding the line. You can't see this, but there's a piece of tape up here for where everybody's getting, you know, supposed to stand. They're not just, our children are not just going to hold the line, but the line's going to be moved. And the line's going to be moved with our grandchildren. We had a conversation up here a while ago amongst some teachers before service started about how the kids of today are not the kids of 35 years ago. Guess what? They're not the kids of 20 years ago. They're not the kids of 10 years ago. They're not even the kids of five years ago. And it's not the kids' fault. I do not blame the children one bit. I'll tell you where the problem lies. The problem lies with the parents and the grandparents and the great-grandparents that have not held the line and have tolerated things. And so today, here we are. Thank you. And that is exactly the problem that we have in our society today. We have got to get back to holding the line and being what God has called us to do because we are living in the accept. What is the accept in your life? Solomon tolerated the dark corners. Uh, he was wholly given to God except. Well, how much except can we tolerate? Galatians chapter 5, verse 9. If you turn over and look at what Paul wrote to the Galatians there, Paul wrote and said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You don't have to put a whole handful of yeast in some dough in order to make the bread rise you put just a little bit of it and set it out there on the counter with a little bit in a bowl with some plastic over it and pretty soon that dude's climbing out of the top what has sin done in our society it doesn't take a lot of sin in your life it just takes a little bit of it and pretty soon it's growing and if you tolerate one sin you will tolerate another one rotten apple ruins the whole barrel, as we say. James chapter 2, verse 10, there on the bottom of the screen. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Where are we on that? What are we tolerating over here and not realizing how it's impacting our lives in some other way? 
And folks, I want you to know this morning, even Solomon would have counseled himself. If somebody would have set him down, Solomon would have counseled himself differently. And I know that because of the other things, and I'm just going to tell you a few of them that Solomon wrote. But what are some of the things that Solomon wrote? In the book of Song of Solomon's, uh, the Song of Solomon, when Solomon was writing about uh, the beauty of marriage and the beauty of this relationship, this love relationship, one of the things that he gave us a warning for in our marriages, and you probably have heard this, beware of the little what? Foxes that creep into the vineyard and steal the grapes. Be careful of what you tolerate be careful of those things that will come into your marriage. How many of you know as married couples, if you've been married for more, Jackson and Mallory may not know it yet. I don't know. They've only been married for a week. We're glad to have them back home safe and sound, by the way. All right? Beware of the little foxes that creep in. What are those things? What about the lack of communication? When time, when, when, uh, when I'm so busy, I don't have time to talk to you right now. What happens? Things start falling apart. We're not spending the time together. Things begin to fall apart. We let this little thing into our life, that little thing into our life, and pretty soon the little foxes are stealing the grapes. Solomon is the one that wrote that and said that this is what we need to be aware. Beware of what you tolerate. Solomon also told us to trust in the Lord in Proverbs 3, chapter 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths and yet Solomon did not counsel himself in that he had the wisdom to write it he understood what it meant but somewhere along the line he began to tolerate some sin in his life he left some dark corners he made some unholy alliances and then problems begin to come in his life in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, Solomon wrote, There's a way which seems right to a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Solomon could have counseled himself with that. There's a way that seems right. Everything that Solomon was doing, it seemed right to make an unholy alliance. It seemed like there's no harm in letting people go out and sacrifice in the groves or in the high places. It seems like it's okay to do these things. Chapter 11 tells us some other things that it seemed like it was okay to do. We'll get to that in a minute. See, Solomon had God's word, but he decided that he could justify his way past God's word. Do you know that when we give in to sin, that's exactly what we've done? We are justifying our way past God's word. Sin is our exaltation of an action above God and his word by our perceived authority. I'm the boss of my life. We want to act like a bunch of little kids and square up with God and say, well, you ain't the boss of me. Yes, he is. He may not be our boss, but he's our judge, and we will be judged accordingly. So now we get on over to 1 Kings chapter 11. So what? as time progressed, as toleration went on, what did we tolerate? How did we get to the point that we got to? We get to the third thing. We have the unholy alliance. We have the dark corners. Now we have... The fact that he chose women over God's word. I want to read verses 1 through 3, the beginning of verse 3 real quickly. But King Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughters of Pharaoh, the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, from the nation of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. We're going to stop right there. Solomon tolerated lust in his life is what Solomon tolerated. Solomon lusted after and he saw these things. And he tolerated lust and that lust grew. Solomon chose women who God had warned the Israelites to avoid at all costs. Because they will pull you away to their God. You will not change them, but they will change you. And what do we find out? Lo and behold, it's exactly what happened. I'm sure you all have heard the little story about the, uh, the little boy, little Johnny. You know, he'd been to church on Sunday and they left after Sunday school or after children's church on the ride home. Of course, mom and dad always want to know, what did you learn in children's church today? Who'd you study about? 
We studied about Solomon. Well, what stood out to you about Solomon? He said that man had 700 wives and 300 porcupines. <laughs> 700 wives and three. I'm thinking if he had that many of them, he'd have been better off with porcupines. <laughs> um, that's not disparaging to the women, I'm just saying. I think there's a reason that God told us one's enough. All right. <laughs> 700 wives and 300 porcupines. And look at the last part of verse 3 that I did not read. And his wives turned away his heart. Who did his wives turn his heart away from? From God. From God. His wives turned away his heart. It was Solomon's tolerance of sin. God had commanded. What did dad tell Solomon back in chapter 2 in verse 3? Keep God's word. Keep God's commands. Keep God's statutes. Keep God's uh, testimonies. Keep God, everything. Keep it from God. But what did God, had God commanded them that Solomon tolerated? He got one woman. He got the, 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 the daughter of the Pharaoh from Egypt. But that wasn't enough. Let's get another one, and another one, and another one, and another one, and another. Winds up with 700 of them, and 300 of them that he wasn't married to. He's got all of these things, and it all results because that somewhere along the line he tolerated sin. Now look at verses 4 through 6. It was so when Solomon was old... That his, wife, that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. Solomon progressed to full-blown idol worship. Because in verse 5 it says, For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And if you went on down, we didn't read it a while ago, but if you roll down to verse 7, he also worshipped or built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and also for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. Let's go through these real quickly. Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth was the god of sensuality and sexuality. It says that he went into full-blown worship. They had high places built. Okay, you would go up to this high place. Part of the worship of Ashtaroth was open sexual action in the middle in front of everybody that was part of the worship and so he would go up and there were temple prostitutes there and they were just openly having all sorts of sexual encounters going on right there in the midst of everything as they worship to Ashtaroth. Milcom and Molech were both gods of um, uh, of, of uh, uh, the fire they were the gods that they offered children to we don't know for sure, but it's very likely that Solomon may. It says he worshipped at the altar of Molech and of, of uh, Milcom. And so what did he do? He goes up and very likely may have even offered one of his own children. And lo and behold, what are we doing today? We're doing the same things. We are still worshiping at the altar of Ashtaroth and Milcom and Molech and Chemosh and all of these other gods. We just don't use that name for them anymore. But we have exalted those things. We have tolerated them in our society to the point that this is where we are today. His heart was turned from God and he did evil in God's sight. At one time, it said he did what was right in the sight of God. It started out with accept. With this one thing that he's tolerating. And now what has it done? It has turned him away. And because of his sin, God has removed the the kingship from his family from his lineages when we justify sin in order to make it tolerable and acceptable folks i want you to know we're using a faulty standard of comparison when we can tolerate sin in our lives if you're here today and you don't know jesus as your savior and, and lord today you are tolerating sin in your life but even some who are here today that our Christians are tolerating sin. So the unsaved person might say, well, what makes me different? Because we know better and because we know who we can turn to. And we want you to know who to turn to today. We want you to know who to get away from that toleration of sin in your life, that you can come to Jesus and you can find freedom, that that chain can be broken in your life. When we 
turn away and begin to tolerate and make sin acceptable in our life. God's word is no longer our guide. Solomon got to the point where he was not concerned about what God's word says. Church, if we're truly concerned about what God's word says, we ought to be in God's house soaking in God's word at every opportunity. But what do we have today? We've got people telling us, well, I can be a Christian and I can live outside in the world and just be just fine. You will not find that in the word of God. See, that's how faulty our thinking is as a society. I can go out and do this. I can do that and it's okay. Not according to the word of God. Acceptability in man's eyes in the times that we live in or self-indulgence becomes the faulty guide that we're using as a source. Well, everybody else is doing it. Everybody else wants me to do it. Or this is simply something that I want to do that's bringing me some sort of a gratification. There's a progression to sin. And James brings it out very clearly to us in James chapter 1, the verses 14 and 15. The progression to sin is this. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away of his own desires and enticed. It's nobody else's fault but ours. We are tempted when we are drawn away by our own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, when we take the next step, Solomon started off tolerating some things, but then sin was conceived, or excuse me, desire was conceived, and when desire was conceived, it gave birth to sin. Solomon's got 700 wives and 300 concubines. That was against the word of God. He is marrying women outside of those that they were supposed to be marrying. That was against God's word. That was against God's will for his life. Solomon is doing all those things, and then as a result of that, as it was conceived, it became sin. Because then he quit worshiping God, something else took the place of God. The trouble with tolerance is that something else ends up being God in your life. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. If you keep riding that line long enough, and that's not the physical death, it doesn't mean you're going to die tomorrow. Although you may, depending on what you've got yourself involved in, but it's the eternal death of the soul. It is the being cast away from the presence of God. We can't say, but you don't understand. None of us are above Solomon. It's not going to be enough to, for us to try to use that as an excuse. Well, you just don't understand my life. Yeah, I do, because the scripture says that Jesus was without sin. So I ask you this morning, what are you tolerating? What are the neverthelesses? What are the accepts in your life that as they are more and more conceived are leading you to sin that will become full grown? When you've got that in your mind, then the next question is, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? I'm going to ask our musicians. It is Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any, any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. I want to tell you before we pray this prayer that if you ask Jesus to lead you today, you have to be leadable. You have to be submissive. This has an opportunity today to be a powerful prayer. Because as we pray this together, we are presenting ourselves to God. We are opening our lives to God. And we're saying, God, I want you to search me. Because I'm faulty at searching myself. See, the church at Ephesus, at the very beginning of our message this morning, would have said, everything's probably great. I like to tell people in our community that thing, when they ask me, hey, how's the church going? We're doing great. But you know what I know? I know that in every one of our lives, there's some things that are being tolerated that shouldn't be.
I know that there are people that need Jesus as their Savior, and they're still needing Jesus as their Savior. I know that there's some things that we need to repent before God from, and how do I know those things? It's not because I've read your mail or because I've been to your house or looked over your shoulder or got a secret camera set up at your house. It's because we are human. And because every day we need Jesus. Because all the time we need the touch of God in our life. So I'm going to ask you, if you will, in all seriousness in your heart right now, to bow your heads and just vocalize this prayer as I, as I lead in it. If you will, just vocally respond back. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. As we sing this morning, our altars are open if you'd like to come.